In our last session, we introduced our sample problem. We will use that scenario as the framework for our discussions of the process. We will consider the domains in order, requirements, behavior, implementation, and validation and verification. This is for convenience and coherence. In a real design situation, we would deal with all four layer by layer as we move the design forward. Although we will deal with each of the four domains, requirements, behavior, physical architecture, and verification and validation, at each successive layer as we drill down into the granularity of our design, the beginning point is always with requirements. If a design were a business meeting, the answer to the question, so, who called this meeting, would have to be the requirements, and that is where we will begin. We can think of requirements as the specifications that define a hole in a puzzle into which the system results will fit. They describe what is missing and needs to be supplied by the system. It's critical for the design team to have a clear picture of the requirements in order to know what shape their new puzzle piece must be in order to fit. Therefore, the quest to design the system truly begins by defining the requirements. Requirements activities take place at every layer. The objective is to do sufficient work on the requirements appropriate to the layer being worked at the time. At the higher levels of abstraction, this means that the sketch of the system being created calls for a sketch of the requirements. As the design advances and increases in granularity, the requirements will become clearer and more detailed. It is not the objective to do all of the requirements work in one go on the first layer. As we go through this next section, we will assume that as systems engineers, we are capturing or eliciting the requirements in addition to just interpreting requirements that have been given to us. The first place we want to gather requirements is from our study of the system context. We want to describe the who and what of our system interfaces and in what form those interfaces will exist. We want to capture the environmental con conditions in the context in which we expect the system to work. In these sessions, we will use the example of a geospatial library to help describe the model-based systems engineering methodology. As we explained in the introduction of the model, the role of the geospatial library will be to gather geospatial imagery products for users. In this example, our requirements for the context will describe the users of the imagery products as well as the collectors of those imagery products. These descriptions are not so constructed so that we create the user or the collectors but are descriptions of the customers and collectors that will reside in our context system. We will look to them to provide us with an understanding of the context within which our system exists. For example, we will be interested to know whether our customers work 24 hours a day or just an eight hour shift, because that information will impact how long we design our system to operate each day. We will also describe the interfaces between the system and the users and collectors. These interfaces will cross the boundary between the system and the context. As we describe the customers and other stakeholders that make up our system context, we will seek to describe their needs. This will define the capabilities that our system will need to bring to the table. These needs will be described initially in the language of the customers and stakeholders. After we collect these customer statements, we will convert them into requirement statements that can then be validated. These translated need statements will tell us what the system needs to do or be, as well as what it will be subjected to. In requirements terms, these are descriptions of the functions, characteristics, and constraints. 
The process of gathering the requirements consists of capturing or eliciting the needs for translation into requirements, decomposing any compound statements into individual requirements, and then as the design advances, deriving the requirements that are implied or otherwise grow out of the originating requirements. Let's look more closely at the first steps around capturing the originating requirements. To really understand the system, we need to understand how the users and other stakeholders envision the activities they will undertake within the system. As systems engineers, we need to understand the operations that the users will be performing. In military terms, we want to understand the missions that the users will undertake with our system. Remember that the users and stakeholders communities can be complex with competing or even contradictory wishes. The users will be doing things within the system. As they undertake their missions, they will often want to achieve lots of things. However, the customer commissioning the design, who may or may not be a user, typically controls the funding and will want to purchase a system within a budget, even if that means that the users do not get everything they want. Other members of the stakeholder community could include regulatory bodies and the government entities. When we gather the operational concepts, we want to gather that understanding independent of a description of the system. We want a description of what the user wants to achieve. We do not want a description of how the user envisions using the this, this system. Although related, these are different things when it comes to the design. Once we have captured the operational concepts, sometimes called the CONOPS, we can start to capture the requirements that describe the system. This is when we capture how the user envisions using the system. Because these requirements come from the user and customer, we typically refer to them as originating requirements. Later on in our model-based systems engineering process, as the systems engineers provide input, we will label the engineering input as derived requirements. As we conduct our requirements analysis, there are several characteristics that we want to ensure that our requirements possess. All requirements must be necessary. If the statement is not needed, then we should remove it. The statement should state what is required of the system, not how the system will meet the requirement. In other words, the requirements should be implementation independent. Good requirement statements should be unambiguous. That is, they should create a common understanding in the various people who will read them. In addition, they should be complete so that they can be understood in isolation. Each statement should be singular. That is, it should address one thought only. Otherwise, it should be decomposed. In addition, all requirements should be inherently possible, that is to say, feasible. In order to be helpful to the design, the requirements should be verifiable so that we can confirm that it is satisfied. It should go without saying that the requirement statements should properly express the stakeholder expectation behind them and conform and look and feel to the organizational standards. Expounding on these characteristics, our requirements should be complete, consistent, feasible, bounded, and structured. They should represent the full definition of the stakeholder expectations, be reconciled such that individual statements do not conflict with one another, be susceptible of satisfaction by a solution that is obtainable within the system lifecycle constraints, establish the system scope and not attempt to address subjects outside that scope. Be organized such that subsets of requirements can't, statements can be identified. Once we have gathered our requirements or been provided with a set of requirements by the customer, we need to perform requirements analysis. 
The goal of the requirements analysis is for us to gain an understanding of what our system needs to do. As we gain this understanding, we want to ensure that we conform to a number of rules for handling the requirements. Therefore, we decompose originating requirements into single testable statements. We capture test requirements as validation requirements. We extract or decompose requirements. We do not edit them. We're careful not to change the meaning of the requirements. We provide traceability from the source document to the parent originating requirements. We provide traceability from each parent requirement to its children, and we prefer hierarchy traceability. But flat file organization of the requirements can be acceptable. An important aspect of systems engineering is that we want to ensure we can trace between the various pieces of information that we gather. In model-based systems engineering, we want to capture that traceability in our model. We want to be able to track back to the sources of the requirements. This may provide important clues as to the meaning and significance of the requirements, which can become important as the design advances and we begin to look at trade-offs and balancing considerations. It can be important to understand the source of the requirements and how the ends they attempt to serve relate to each other. Consequently, we will want to maintain these relationships within our model. As we look for tools to support our model-based systems engineering process, we will want to ensure that they can implement this robust traceability within our model. As the requirements are analyzed, issues are very likely to be identified with the requirements. We want to set out to resolve those issues, to aid understanding of the issue, and to also prevent rework in the future. We want to capture information on the issue and record its resolution. This allows us to maintain traceability and manage the handling of the issue. These issues emerge in two different categories, concerns and risks. In our terminology, concerns are something that the engineers must deal with. Here, the acceptance of requests is not defined as to the form of the request. It will have to be resolved within the specification of the requirement statement. Risks, on the other hand, are something that the systems engineers have identified, but someone else, such as the project manager or customer, has to deal with or make decisions about. For example, a risk will impact cost and schedule and will need to be mitigated. This mitigation is carried out by the responsible party and tracked by the systems engineer and the tool. The risk identified here is to be resolved by cross-training the staff in a variety of skills. That is done by the operational process owners, but it's tracked in the design. The information associated with the requirements activities can be captured as use cases and requirements. In our system definition language, the two are related through the elicits relationship. A use case elicits a requirement. Once the requirements are gathered and refined, they create a picture of what is expected from the system. It is from this picture that the design gets its marching orders. In the end, the system results must match the descriptions created by the requirements. As we move forward to our next session, we will consider the behavior that will satisfy the requirements we have been gathering. I look forward to being with you again next time.